Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. We're so glad you joined us. My name is J. Darren Gross. I'm a real estate investor and a commercial property insurance broker. I've been an insurance broker for 25 plus years, and my primary client base is and has been real estate professionals, investors, landlords, property managers, and developers. Based on this, I'm continually looking for more information about real estate investing for both my own investments and so that I can better serve my clients. The result of these efforts has led to the creation of Commercial Real Estate Pro Network, and CREPN Radio. The goal is to have and share a conversation with experts on topics of interest to commercial real estate investors and professionals. No matter how you found us, whether it be LinkedIn, Facebook, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, Twitter, or YouTube, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, Your comments, likes, shares, and follows are all greatly appreciated. Okay, today's topic, I um, wanted to get into a, a, a topic that um, uh, I've become interested in, should I say. And it, it's based on this. Since the, the housing crash of 2008, the rental market has exploded and rents continue to show double-digit percentage growth year over year in many markets. And while that's very positive for the investor... Uh, stagnant wage growth has provided the source for a separate conversation about affordable housing. And in an effort to learn more about affordable housing and how it works, I reached out to today's guests who are experts in low-income housing, ha- low-income housing tax credits, uh, Nicolo Panoli and Warren Sebra of Novo Gradic and Company. If you are invested in or you manage low-income housing or perhaps you have wondered how it works, I believe you'll find this very informative. Here now is my interview. First off, I want to start by introducing our our guest today. Uh, We're fortunate to have Nicolo Panoli and Warren Sebra of Novo, how do I say the name of the the firm? Novo Gradic and Company. Novo Gradic and Company. So first of all, welcome to both of you. Thanks for uh, being on the program today. Thanks for having us, Darren. Great. Thank you. Great. And, and your guys, your role at uh, Novo Grata, are you... you uh, well, Warren and I are both partners. We're a CPA firm who specializes in tax credits, and Warren and I both work very extensively within the low-income housing tax credit area. And for those of you who don't know, Novo Grata and Company is a national firm with offices uh, throughout the country, headquarters in San Francisco, but we have offices East Coast, middle of the country, and also in the West Coast, the United States. Great. All right. Well, let's, let's jump into this. And, you know, I think the, um, what, what prompted me to reach out to you guys was um, I'm here in Portland, and, and I recognize you guys, your, your office is in Portland. Uh, you don't have to look very far right now to see a number of cranes uh, putting up uh, multifamily housing. And uh, the news is constantly about the uh, rent increases, and and then there's a a new conversation talking about uh, possible rent controls, and and in that there's a a conversation about affordable housing, and the the conversation kind of stops at that, uh, at least what I pick up in the the mainstream press. Uh, there's nothing that dives down deeper to talk more about uh, what what is affordable housing and and how is it uh, funded. And so that's that's kind of where uh, where I'm coming from, and hoping that we can we can have a little conversation about uh, how, what low income housing uh, tax credits are and how they're used to develop housing. And so with that, uh, let me ask: Can you can you give us a a, uh, a brief kind of overview of, of what they are and, and how they work? Sure, yeah, I can. sure. I, I think. Um, it's important to note that when we talk about affordable housing, there's a lot of different programs out there and a lot of different mechanisms the federal government uses for um, affordable housing. 
But specifically what we'll talk about today is you know, the low-income housing tax credit. Um, and that tax credit is one of the main tools that the federal government does have. Um, and when you think about the low-income housing tax credit, there's really within there is two programs within one program. And what I mean by that is in the low-income housing industry, there's two types of credits. There's a 4% credit and a 9% credit. And the 4% credit is, is in conjunction with, with issuance of tax and bonds. And you, when you get a tax and bond issued, you can go out and develop a low-income housing project and not have to apply to the state to receive um, credits. And, therefore, and then that, that your credit percentage is a floating rate, and we'll talk about how to calculate it later, but, and it's called, generally called the, the 4% credit. The 9% credit is still under the umbrella of the low-income housing tax credit, but it's a credit where you have to apply to the state to receive that credit. And, you know, each state receives an allocation from the federal government based upon the population size. And that's the competitiveness of the uh, LIHTC credit is applying to the state and meeting each individual state's, state's um, guidelines and mandates for affordable housing. And the states really have all the controls to decide which affordable housing projects are going to be built in their state. Um, they have, and they have various programs to sponsor um, preservation deals or senior deals or other type of deals. And that the, the application um, is, varies in every state. And so it's important to make sure you know what state you're applying and also know um, what, what to do in terms of um, presenting your project to the state. Um, most states you apply each year. Some states you have a, have a there's two application rounds. So that's kind of the basic of how the program is structured. Um, and well, maybe I'll jump in and just add right. a few other observations. That in if you're looking at it at a very very high level, what you're doing as an owner of the of a property, and typically this is either a new construction project that we're talking about, or it's an ACT rehab deal. Those are the, the two really big picture types of deals we have in affordable housing. And, and as an owner of the property, you're really making a trade-off. You're, you're trading the potential for market rate rents, and in exchange what you're doing is you're accepting some very nice financing. Um, so it, it tends to be to work best in deals where, where that trade-off pays off well, where the, you end up agreeing to rent restrictions, and those rent restrictions are based on the area median income for that area. And in exchange, you receive a very nice subsidy that lowers your debt on the property and ends up reducing the amount of debt service that you have to pay. So it's sort of a trade-off that way where you get lower net operating income um, but also have lower debt service. And it's a very attractive program uh, for, for that reason that you can still build some very nice housing and be able to provide it to people who really desperately need housing uh, but really can't find it on the market because, in, in many cases, uh, the market rate is much more than they can reasonably afford to pay. And, and I also would add that as part of their um, the developers who are into the or get into this deal is you know, there's potentially there's not a lot of cash flow in these deals. Some deals are structured that they have some cash flows, but nowhere know that that happens later on, maybe year four, five, six, seven. But what happens is they get cash from the deferred developer fee and a payment to them, uh, cash flow payment of the developer fee. And that is one of the things that developers do economically get a benefit as well as through, through that developer fee. Got it. So both uh, on the front end, the developer fee, and then also the long-term uh, financing, your your um, uh, debt service is significantly reduced, uh, thereby allowing the, the lower operation cost and, and uh, lower need for uh, uh, market rate rents. That that was uh, yeah. That's uh, a general trade-off. Is is that ability to and effectively. What you end up doing is you form a partnership, and that partnership allows you to allocate those tax credits to the investor, and the investor in turn contributes equity uh, in exchange for receiving those tax credits. Typically, the equity comes in relatively early in the process, you know, during construction, and certainly by the time 
you finish and convert your construction loan to a perm loan, your equity will be in. And that allows you on a permanent basis to borrow a lot less debt and, and still be able to cover that lower debt uh, with that reduced rents that, that we've been talking about. Got it. So in uh, the marketplace, and I don't know, I, I, um, I think I'd read somewhere that, that the percentage of current construction of these uh, projects, is there a, is there a number that, uh, that you, that you are aware of as far as the, of uh, the total units being constructed now that, that are in the low income housing uh, tax credit program? Do you know? Well, in terms of the total volume, and the unit number can be difficult to pin down because it tends to bounce around a little bit from year to year, but in terms of the total volume of, of equity coming into deals related to credits, on an average annual basis, you're looking somewhere between six, seven, eight billion dollars a year nationwide that's coming in uh, that, that usually is an equity investment in a much larger project size. So total development costs on a six, seven, eight billion dollar size nationwide, you're looking really at more like in a 10 to 15 billion dollars of total project costs that are being supported by that equity with debt and soft debt and deferred developer fees sort of comprising the rest of the capital stack on that sort of a, a scale. So you're looking at typically nationwide uh, on any given year, certainly tens of thousands and upwards of hundreds of thousands of units that are being developed. And if you look at kind of just using our area, Portland, Oregon, as, as an example, typically in any given year, about seven to eight projects are going to be receiving an allocation and of credits from the state from the state and that's on the competitive nine uh, percent competitive side nine percent side. side and so typically we've seen in the whole state of oregon you know if you include the four percent non-competitive credit you, there's going to be about between 10 and 12 projects done a year in the state of oregon and that, in some years it could be less or more um but that kind of gives you how many in oregon, in oregon are being done and obviously in states of california and new york and florida and texas it's a larger amount than that, but that kind of gives you a sense of how many of these projects. And, and, and those projects are typically in Oregon, which would be 50 and 80 units large. Gotcha. So on that uh, kind of a, a basis, can you kind of walk us through some numbers on something like that, a 50-unit project in, in Oregon? What, what, and it doesn't have to be in Oregon. I'm just saying I think sometimes it's more – uh, useful to have an example uh, to kind of walk through if you've got X for development cost and and uh, what the what the uh, tax credits might be worth and how the how the I guess two questions how the development comes together and then uh, how it uh, operates uh, you know on the on the uh, rent side. Yeah, sure. And I think if you look at a, at a really easy example. Um, of a project, let's just say 10, a $10 million project. Some projects are higher than that um, in terms of development costs and some are lower. Um, but $10 million is kind of an easy number to work with in terms of do, doing the numbers. And we're focused right now on just talking about the 9% competitive process. Right. Uh, and so if you have a, a $10 million project and for our analysis, we're going to assume all those costs are, are, are costs that will qualify for the credit because some, some of the costs you incur, like land and other costs, doesn't qualify for the credit. But for, for ease of our discussion, it's all the $10 million of the cost qualifies for the credits. Generally, your equity on a 9% deal is going to be around 70% um, of, of your um, sources. So that, in that case, you, you, in, this, in this deal, you could have um, a, a upwards to close to um, seven million dollars in equity. And the reason why that is is your credits. You can receive credits over. You're claiming the credits over ten years. They're earned over fifteen years, but you're claiming them over ten years. And so, a ten million dollar project, if you have a tax rate percentage of nine percent, you are getting um, nine hundred thousand dollars worth of credits. Um, over those those ten years, 
So nine nine hundred thousand per year for ten years gives you yeah, nine million 000, in credits. Right. right. So nine hundred thousand dollars per year uh, of credits. Is that some sort of a formal uh, document agreement that you receive from the was it the IRS or who who? Uh, hey, so the, state, maybe it's because. Uh, Maybe this is a good time to kind of talk about the way the, how the federal government works and how the state agencies kind of play together uh, and work with the program. So the federal government role in this is they set the, the laws and the rules surrounding um, low-income housing tax credits. And all the rules are found in Section 42 of the Internal Revenue Code and the regulations and other guidance IRS has, has given out. But after that, the IRS really has a hands-off approach in this program. And what I mean by that is they have deferred the compliance and the administration of the program to the state allocating agencies. And each state has an allocating agency, you know, that they, uh, that they have that will run and administer this program. And you, at the same agency you apply for the credit, um, you also report to them once you have all your, your, your construction built, and you report back to them, and you give them another application that says, hey, here's all of our costs, which are certified by uh, a CPA firm like ours. And once they receive that and other documents, they'll issue what's called an 8609, and that allows you to claim the credits once you have that 8609. Before you have I the think 8609. That's, that's an important distinction because you think about most tax credits that probably most people are familiar with. Most credits are just something that you qualify for by virtue of, of doing the thing. Um, most of us have kids, for example, and, and we're used to, hey, I have a kid, and so therefore I get a claim of credit. The government doesn't have to give me a form to tell me I can claim the credit. I don't have to go through some long application process. There's a very different process involved in having kids that probably outside of the scope of yeah. this. <laughs> Thank you for um, clarification. Just in case those of you who are wondering. Um, but in this program, there's actually a requirement if you're going to claim this credit, you have to go through an administrative process of going to the state, asking for the credit, qualifying for the credit, and then getting this form from the state that says you're eligible to actually claim the credit. And that's your golden ticket. And gotcha. You, and you can, once you have that, you can claim the credit for, for, uh, for 10 years. And, and, gotcha. and then the, the state's also responsibility, besides the um, awarding of the, of the credits and and uh, issuing the, the 8609 forms for claiming the credits is they also make sure the project on, op on the operation side is in compliance. And so they'll, they'll come out each year and do a compliance audit. Um, some states every two years where they do a compliance audit and make sure the, on the operation side that the project is, is running under um, the laws that the IRS have issued. And, and also the, what you have reached the state. So once you have the, the 8609, the state, the state then gives you a, a regulatory agreement that you're bound to with the state um, to follow the rules of the, the federal program. And then it's very important because you, if you fall out of compliance, um, you can have, potentially have recapture. And what that involves is you have to pay back the investor for the loss of credits because you weren't in compliance for a certain year or a certain month of the year. And, and the, I got a quick question for you on that, that compliance thing. So, is that is that strictly a uh, you didn't rent to um, qualified tenants that would qualify in, under the the affordable housing guidelines, or are there other things that could throw you out of that? So there are so many ways that you could fail under this program that we could probably be here for months talking about the various different ways. But just to give you sort of a broad brush view of the key areas that I think we, we tend to see people that really should be focused on and, and from time to time struggle with. I think the, the rent and income limits are, are certainly two of the key areas, which is there's a maximum amount of rent you can charge, and you can't charge more than that. And that's formulaic based on area median income and the size of the unit and the number of people living in it. So that, that's one factor. And the other is that the tenants have to meet certain income limits. And, and as long as they meet those income limits when they move in, they're fine to stick around and continue renting the unit. Um, but I think making sure that you properly document, and there's an entire administrative process, an entire HUD handbook 
that is hundreds of pages long that goes into precisely how, what are the procedures around documenting uh, someone's income um, that you probably don't even want to begin to know about today just because it's so intense. And I think the third area that tends to be one of focus is making sure that you're keeping the units up to uh, a habitability standard. And that can include a whole host of issues. Obviously, if there's ever any damage to the unit, you've got to return it to and restore it to its uh, required state. But it can also include things like, I mean, we've had clients who've gotten into <clears throat> exciting discussions with the state about things like Americans with Disability Acts accessibility and needing in to, to put in certain ramps in some places, issues with you know, even some very ministerial things about the project where uh, you've got pigeons that seem to love your, your property, and so they end up pooping all over the place, and, and the state gets grouchy about the amount of pigeon poop on the site. And things like that can, can become issues where the state will observe that they don't think you're meeting that habitability requirement, and so as a result, you end up getting cited by the state for noncompliance, and if if you're not quick about fixing things, then you'll find yourself in a spot where you might have an event of recapture. The you mentioned about the habitability. If um, if there was a some sort of a, a, I don't know a fire in a, in a at a property that that created a situation, is there if it took an extended amount of time to put that back for that time while you're you're out of service, would you essentially lose those credits? Well, yeah, and that's, that's an important thing to talk about. And I think you really look to the, the rules related to what we call casualty events uh, tend to break down into two categories. One is a situation that's a localized situation that just affects your building. And the other situation is a more widespread building, or widespread situation where it might affect a larger region. You think about Hurricane Katrina, for example, that came through and affected a large swath of the South. And, and, and let's talk first about the local situation where maybe just your building burns down, and then we can go to the example of a more widespread disaster and how that affects your, your credits. And typically when you've got a more localized situation, a flood, a fire, smoke damage, something going on in the unit that, that, that makes it unhabitable, maybe somebody was running a meth lab and you've got to get it cleaned up, and you're forced to take a unit or a number of units offline, the, the key standard and metric is whether you get the units back online before year end and ready for occupancy. Uh, let's say you had a flood in February. As long as you can get those units back online before year end, you can continue to claim credits for those units without any interruption as long as you're beyond the first year of the credit period. And so that's that's kind of the magical date. Now, if you end up, uh, it's a fire and your entire building burns down and it takes you 12, 16, 18 months to rebuild, then while you're rebuilding, you're going to end up losing the credits for the time period that you're rebuilding. So that's, that's not a, a great answer for someone who's looking at a localized disaster, but there tends to be uh, some fancy calculations and analysis to decide whether it makes sense to rebuild. And I think luckily, in most cases, if, you've got, if you're well insured and you have insurance proceeds that will sort of cover the cost of rebuilding, it's generally a pretty good idea to go ahead and rebuild. Uh, contrast that with a more widespread disaster like a Hurricane Katrina, and certainly that's just sort of the largest example in recent history, certainly not the only one as we've had lots of other floods and, and other natural disasters throughout the country, but the, the way it typically happens is uh, our good friends in Washington will de declare a disaster, and so you're subject to a, a much more uh, kinder set of rules that allows you potentially up to two years to restore your property, and during that time period, you can continue to claim credits, and you don't have, face any loss of credits. Uh, and as long as you get your property back online, typically within that two-year time frame. And so that, that's a, a much kinder, gentler, more accommodating approach. So hopefully we're never in a spot where that's a situation that actually happens, but it does happen from time to time. Sure. Well, and like you said, if, if the event happens in the, in the local one, uh, if it happens in February, you've got a, probably a pretty good chance of getting things back online. But if 
if something were to happen, say, in uh, around the uh, Christmas season or, or Thanksgiving and uh, take that down, I'm assuming for that year, then you've lost those tax credits. Is that that's right. So schedule all your disasters at the beginning of the year in the first <laughs> yeah. quarter as opposed to in January the January is quarter. our month for disasters, right? Yeah, and I think that's – that's you might look at that and say, well, that doesn't make any sense or that's rather capricious and cruel. And that's, you know, that's just based on a simple reading of the way the statute is written. I'm not sure anyone necessarily intended for that to be the case, but that's the way the math ends up working based on a literal reading of the statute. Got it. All right, and um, let's see. We were talking about the uh, – you went into the uh, the key areas of how you could fail, uh, the um, income and, and uh, renting to the, the tenants and the habitability. Um, trying to think here. So on, on the – on determining the rents, and, and I, I get that uh, there's the the area median income, uh, and up to a percentage of that is where one qualifies for the housing, if I understand right. Yep. And then based on that, the percentage, the, the, what is it, up to 30% of whatever they're they're uh, receiving for income, then is what the rent. I mean, in round numbers, I don't know if that's that holds true. Yeah, well, maybe that... we can walk through an example here in Portland yeah. that might be illustrative for your listeners. And and obviously it's going to vary from location to location because it is based on area median income. But you think here in Portland for a family of four, and, it, and the, the calculations are based on family size, uh, for a family of four, area median income is right around 50 grand. And to participate in the program, you make commitments about what percentage of area median income your units are going to target. And typically on a 4% bond deal, as Warren mentioned, you're going to be able to rent to most of your units, most or even all of your units are going to be at 60% of AMI. If you're doing a 9% deal, often in order to be attractive to get the credits, you might have to be willing to skew down to 50, 40, 35, 30%, in some cases even 20%. Of AMI, but let's just go with 60 for now because the math's relatively simple. So if I start with 50 grand as being roughly AMI for a family of four, and let's assume for a moment I'm dealing with a family of four that's looking into to move into one of my units. Uh, so uh, then then you're looking at 60% of 50, so that's going to get you down to $30,000. So that family could make $30,000 a year and qualify for a, a unit. Um, and, and if you look at the rent then, to be affordable, the rent has to be 30% of, of that AMI amount. So 30% of 30 grand is going to get you $9,000. Uh, you break that down into a monthly basis, and you're looking at somewhere in the range of roughly 750 bucks a month for that unit. Got it. That's a very sort of rough, rough calculation. And Typically, uh, what you're looking at when, when you're doing affordable housing, they, for any given unit size, there's an assumption around the number of people that are living in the unit based on the number of bedrooms. So typically, a family of four is going to live in uh, a two-bedroom apartment, and, and so they would be subject to that rent restriction and that income restriction. Got it. Um. So you mentioned, and it sounds like it would be a lengthy conversation, but the the annual uh, qualifying of the of the tenants to make certain they're still meeting whatever the the guidelines set for their their uh, rental unit is at. Yeah, I think so. it's important to to know that it could be overbearing to try to try to figure out how to calculate these limits and what you can charge the tenants. And luckily for the viewers, um, our website, novoco.com, we have a rent and income calculator, and you can put up whatever um, county or metro area you're in and search what the rents are, and it will automatically calculate for you. And so oh, that's, that's great. a tool that you can use. And also, for uh, the operations side, when typically a developer who – does not have experience in loan housing. Normally, you're hiring an outside property manager, has, and you're going to find someone who has lots of experience in loan income housing tax credit compliance. 
And so I just hope people don't feel that they're, they have to figure out this all on their own. There's lots of p- professionals out there in the property management business that knows a lot about this, and they already have uh, employees that really kind of know how to, to certify tenants and operate a low-income housing um, project in terms of compliance. Um, Great. Now that, <clears throat> that's certainly something I, I would think that uh, if you're if you're – Investing in one of these, you certainly would want to have a professional to uh, keep all the, or I mean, just to manage it and also to uh, uh, all the record keeping. It sounds like it's uh, pretty involved. So right. yeah, you'll find that for any given project, there are boxes and boxes and boxes of income certifications and supporting documentation uh, that you end up keeping for 20 plus years in order to document your compliance. And if you are a 100% affordable project, because sometimes you have some mixed use involved, the annual certifications don't have to be done. Um, you have to certify any new tenant, but once you have a tenant in there, you're not required to annually certify those tenants. They can go over income and not um, be, be, um, uh, still be in the unit. Oh, interesting. So if it's more of a starting point then yeah, for right. for. Uh, qualification and typically you have to apply to the state to to actually get that right to not have to recertify the tenants but in general the the key decision point is when they move in whether they meet the income requirements because the government's not going to kick them out later on simply because uh, they've gone out and found a better job or gotten a raise at work Uh, rather they're going to look to the tenant deciding that they're ready to move up in life based on making more money and going out and either finding another apartment that is better suited to their needs or, or buying a house. Got it. No, that's, that's a, um, that's good. And I mean, it, it definitely kind of clears the, uh, or clarifies the picture there. I was kind of, I had this, uh, uh picture in my mind that, uh, you know, every year the uh, landlord or the manager was going around, knock, knock, knock. I need to see your W2s to, uh, to uh, make sure you qualify there, but uh, seems like it's much more uh, reasonable, uh, especially I'm assuming if you have a family and you're you are trying to better yourself and get yourself, you know, move on up or whatever, and and uh, you know having up for your your family because all of a sudden you, you did too well at work or something like that. So right, that's good. Right. Well, and you can um, imagine just the logistical nightmare of having to call in the sheriff every couple of weeks. <laughs> come and boot somebody out of their unit and that would just be an absolute nightmare yeah yeah i can see oh they got a new car they got a problem here um okay and and just to kind of circle back here a little bit you you mentioned some uh the term of commitments the the tax credits uh if i understand right they they're good for 10 years but there was a there was a mention of a 15-year commitment um can you Touch on that this again. This is a fun part. Yeah. Uh, this okay. is absolutely a fun part. There's, there's a 15-year initial compliance period, so you have to comply for 15 years just to get those credits. And I think that's, that's an interesting artifact of our program is while the credits are claimed over 10 years, they're actually earned over 15. So if for some reason there was an event of noncompliance during those out years, say 11, 12, 13, so on, there would be a loss of some of the previous credits claimed. However, in addition to that initial compliance period, under federal statute, uh, by virtue of receiving the credits for any deal that was done after 1990, so any deal that's done these days, uh, there is a minimum 30-year compliance period where you have to uh, enter into uh, an allocation regulatory agreement that uh, is actually recorded against the dirt that requires that the property maintain its affordability and income restrictions through a full 30 years. And above and beyond that, when you're getting into the 9% competitive side of the program, many states will require an additional, even longer commitment. A great example is our friends just to the south down in California have a a minimum 55-year affordability commitment just to even submit an application. There are some states I've heard of, I want to say Rhode Island, gives you upwards of a 99-year commitment. So certainly, while the federal requirement is merely at 30 years, 
there is often an extended requirement that can extend well beyond that minimum. I, it sounds like you're committed. If you, uh, oh, you really, you got to yeah. be all in. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you, you mentioned that because, uh, again, while I was um, preparing for this, there was a an article I read, I think it was a property here locally that had, and I think it was something where the records hadn't been uh, well kept and there was a sale and there was some sort of a, um, uh, I don't know, there was a workaround with the the tenants that were there that were thought they had to sign up for X number of years. And I don't remember, I, I think there was actually a recapitalization. They were going to, no, actually they're taking it from, they were taking this property from uh, the low income housing tax uh, credit program to a market rate uh, property. And uh, I don't know. It, I think it, you might be referring to a rather infamous case that happened here in the Portland area, not too long ago. And, they, and there is a, there's not the, delve too deep into um, the rules of local housing tax credit, but there is a way called qualified contract, which allows someone to apply for to relieve the uh, the the, the, uh, the restriction of rent from the project, and you can do that at year 15. Um, but that typically it's a, it's a process that is not favored by the state agencies, and some state agencies actually make you commit that you won't do that before you get an allocation. But so that could have happened in Oregon, and they do allow for it, uh, so they could have gone through that process. But it's, it's well, I mean, after that 15-year, yes, at least, I mean, beyond that. So. And I think, Darren, the deal you're talking about was actually kind of, if you will, a failed deal, uh, where you had a new owner looking to buy the property uh, that, that really couldn't go on. And I think it might not have even, it was really very early on in the process. They m- might have gotten some tenants in, but really struggled to make a go of it. A new owner came in and thought, you know what, I'm just going to operate this as a, a market rate property. And then uh, there was a, a lawsuit uh, brought by, on behalf of some of the tenants, to try and keep it as affordable housing and uh, a whole song and dance about and lawsuit around whether the property had to remain as affordable housing or not and what the rights of the state agency were to try and relieve some of those obligations, whether they had the right to even waive some of those obligations at all. Right. Well, it sounds like a, a more more involved conversation. We probably have time for it today. Um, just want to circle back here and, and, and just to get on these timelines, though. So we've got a, uh, a 10-year uh, window where we – we received the tax credits, uh, they're earned over 15, um, and then it sounds like the state by state will determine whether or not uh, 30 years or 55 years or however long the, the property has to stay in the, in the program. Um, With a minimum of 30 under the federal statute. Gotcha. So as the property goes, I'm assuming that the numbers uh, start to improve to where uh, it, the, the operating budget uh, would allow for a, a refinance or something. I mean, if you need to, uh, capital improvements or, or, you know, I'm trying to think of all the various uh, types of things that, that a property owner typically looking to get some sort of uh, benefit uh, beyond, beyond rent per se. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, – once you get beyond that, is, is, does the property then requalify for um, potentially additional credits, or would that be a, a, um, a rehab project, or, or am I making sense? Yeah, yeah Darren. So I think, it, oh, go ahead, Nicole. I think that's a great question, and, and certainly is one that comes up often, is at what point in time could the property qualify to be you know, what we call resyndicated? Uh, which is basically flipped into a new deal and, and have an act rehab done on it to often freshen it up. And it's common where you get a property when they get 15 years down the road, there can be some deferred maintenance. And at times that deferred maintenance can be very significant. And, and it's even common where, you know, I have some clients who took housing stock that was originally built maybe as, during World War II as sort of worker housing, 
And then they went and did a deal in, say, the 90s to do an ACK rehab and freshen it up and, and reposition it and, and make it pretty nice housing. And then by the time another 15 years rolls around and we get to 2010 or 2015, the property is, is really in need of some further repair. And there's, there's two different ways, a few different ways you can go about it. Uh, one very common approach is to do a new deal, a new tax credit deal, and you're eligible to do that once your, your initial 15-year compliance period is completed. You couldn't do it after 10 years. You'd have to wait until the end of 15 years. Um, so that's good news is that certainly once that initial 15-year period is up, it is possible to, even though your extended use period, which may run out 30, 40, 55, 99 years, even though that may not have run in full, you can still do a new tax credit deal and, and recapitalize the property in that fashion. You also see uh, a lot of developers where you get to that point in time and you've got some options. It is common where a developer will buy out a limited partner at that point in time um, and, and use that then as a mechanism for really owning the property outright on their own and then having a lot of fun decisions to make about can I go and refi this property, obviously depending on how well the property is cash flowing. And, and what the rents have been recently. If you're lucky, rents have been rising and expenses haven't been rising quite as much. So the property's probably been cash flowing nicely and you've got an option to go ahead and, and do a refi and either use the proceeds then to spruce up the building a bit more or maybe cash some of that out or both, depending on how well it's been cash flowing. And that's, that's really all just a function of the math game and, and what the needs are for your property. But certainly those options are, are on the table uh, as long as you continue to, to, under the terms of your regulatory agreement, to meet your rent and income restrictions. Would the clock reset then on the, the commitment with the 30 years for the new financing? Would that reset or would that be in addition to the already um, 15 years remaining on your 30-year clock? It's gonna, you... Typically, it's going to reset. So the, reset. Your state would, the states will normally you know, cancel the... Um, regulatory agreement you have with them and then issue a new one. Gotcha. And that's only if you actually go back in for another slug of credits, right? If you're just right. doing a refi or, or, and you could even sell the property. I mean, there, there are a large number of properties on the secondary market that sell even, and, and the restrictions stay in place even if you sell. But there are a large number of properties and a large number of brokers out there who help broker deals where these properties get sold and change hands and the new owners keep the rent and income restrictions in place and keep running the property the same way it's been running. Got it. Um, I'm looking down my uh, list of my list of questions. Um, we talked about the, um, the the potential fails, the timelines, the, the recapitalization. Is there something that that uh, you you feel like we should uh, uh, expand on there, or is this a, a, a reasonable uh, stopping point, or is there a, anything you wish I would have asked you about? Well, you know, one of the elements, one of the wrinkles here that a lot of people may not fully understand is just how uh, who are the who are the investors that are the typical players in this market who come in and pay good money for these credits. And, and what types of organizations can even play that role. And I think at times there can be a misperception. Um, and, and part of the reason is that uh, there's, there's limited utility for many taxpayers in terms of their ability to use the credit. So, Darren, if you and I, for example, just happened to have millions of dollars laying around and wanted to go and invest in affordable housing projects and effectively buy these credits, our ability to use the credits would be pretty limited for a number of reasons, one of which is, well, first of all, you have to have millions of dollars in tax liability, and there aren't typically a lot of individuals with that. In general, these credits only offset taxes from passive income, and so as a result, there aren't many taxpayers who have a whole lot of passive income. And, mm. and I think the, the, that, that tends to be a real limiting factor as well. Um, and, and there's often another restriction, which is you can only really get up to about 
$30,000 worth on a deduction basis. So if you look at the credits themselves, it's about $10,000 worth of credits every year to an individual, unless they're a real estate professional. And even real estate professionals, hell, they've only got so much taxable income, so much ability to use these credits. So it's common in, in our world, and I'd say almost universally so, that the investor who's buying these credits is usually a large bank and because they have that tax liability, because they're not subject to that, that passive income restriction, and because they have lots of money lying around to buy these credits. And these days, the credits are going at a very attractive price. Uh, here in Portland, it's very common to see the credits sell for a dollar or even above a dollar. So in Warren's example where we had a $10 million project, uh, and chances are a project with $10 million in qualifying costs probably has more like $12 million in total costs. And, and a $9 million credit stream, if the investor is paying a dollar, they're paying $9 million in equity into your deal, which means you don't need a whole lot of debt. That's a beautiful, beautiful situation to be in. And I think that's one thing a lot of people might not understand is that effectively – you're giving up ownership of, uh, of a large part of, of the partnership that owns your asset to this investor for the time period that they're in the deal. And so, and usually, you know, you think about the prices these investors are paying, where they're paying a dollar, sometimes a dollar five, a dollar ten. I've seen in some unique situations, a dollar fifteen or a dollar twenty, they're getting a relatively skinny return. And we're talking about a return, an after-tax return that could be 5%. It could dip below that. As that credit price rises, you're looking at, in some cases, a 4 or even a 3% after-tax return, which is pretty skinny. And, and the reason why most of these banks are willing to, to buy these credits um, at such minimal returns tends to be a, a matter of they qualify for a Community Reinvestment Act credit. So that's one. And I think also because banks are always uh, on the outlook for opportunities to improve their public image. And this is an opportunity for them to demonstrate that, you know, we're giving back to the community. And, and obviously, you look around today, and banks don't have a really good, <laughs> a really good reputation. Um, you yeah. Know, last, night, last night, we had the Republican presidential debate. Right. Everybody loves to beat up on banks. So this is an opportunity for them to attempt to to shine their image up a bit and show that we're doing nice things and, and not just sort of being greedy bankers. Yeah, and when, right. when the investor comes on board, they're, they're going to require some reporting as well. They don't just give the money and say, we'll see you in 10 years when the credits are up. They're going to monitor the asset, and they're going to require annual audit of the financial statements. And, you know, obviously there's going to be tax returns involved to be filed. And, you know, you know, our, our, our firm typically helps out in those audited financial statements. And they're also going to have, you know, quarterly reports, and they will charge um, the project and asset management fee of, you know, anywhere between five to $10,000 a year for the, what, to pay, cover their costs to, you know, asset manage the property for, from, their, from their perspective. Gotcha. I want to go back here just a little bit on – so, so this bank, they uh, they buy the credits. Uh, they're the partner in the LLC that develops the project. After the credits have been uh, used, or your ten, let's just say, you're fifteen years out, does that bank then uh, do they usually stay a partner in the the partnership so that they continue to have that equity? Or so you've got some options. Yeah, yeah. Typically, there's lots of different options. And we actually have a myriad of trainings that talk about year 15 exits for the low income housing tax credit project. But generally, they do have lots of options. They can stay in the deal and, oper- and just as they did before, they can be a partner in the deal because that partnership agreement they signed 15 years ago is still in effect. Or they can, um, the, the project can sell the property to somebody else and liquidate the partnership and both the GP and LP uh, are gone. Um, a lot of times what th- does happen in, is the GP will buy out the LP's interest in some form or fashion. 
um, and then the LP goes separate ways. And, then, and, the, and that calculation is pretty complicated, and also um, uh, sometimes there's an option in there um, for them to buy, but there, there is some mechanism typically in a partnership agreement to talk about how the LP is going to exit, and then that, that, that happens to a GP buying out the LP. And the LP uh, is the investor in this case? Yes, right. yeah, yes. Okay. yes. And the, I would the, probably the, just add one distinction here that the, in our world of tax credits, there's actually a special provision for an, a nonprofit general partner, nonprofit developer that allows them to buy out that investor, usually at, at a bargain price, basically to pay whatever the investor's taxes are and assume the debt. And, and often the investor's taxes from exiting are zero. If they, they pay off their tax bill of zero, assume the debt, then they can get the property for essentially a song. And, and that's a nice option for a lot of nonprofit participants in this program. On the for-profit side, if I've got a for-profit developer, for-profit sponsor, they don't have that same option. As Warren mentioned, often they have an option to buy out the limited partner at fair market value. And that's, that's where things get exciting is precisely how much is fair market value for this particular property. And it's not uncommon for those payouts where the general partner is buying out the investor. Those, those can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for a property that's a re really a very valuable property, either in terms of its cash flow or its potential market value. Got it. Um, that, that, uh, that's interesting. I mean, that year 15, all the, um, the uh, possibilities there. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else? And again, I, I want to be respectful of you guys' time. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, is there anything that, that you'd like to um, uh, include or, or summarize? Or You know, I think um, one thing that's really intriguing about the program is chances are you've walked past a lot of affordable housing projects and you didn't even know it. Uh, and I think a lot of people, when they think of affordable housing, um, they think of something that, out of the 60s uh, where it's sort of this old, dingy, almost like a communist era type of an old apartment building that the government built under some HUD program. Um, when, and, and these days, that is definitely not the case for these affordable housing projects. Many of them are exceptionally nice projects to live in with a lot of amenities. And, and you could walk past them on the street and think, hey, I'd like to live there, and not even realize that it's an affordable housing project. So I think that's, that's one wrinkle and element that a lot of people may not even really understand. And, and part of that is driven simply by the way the program is structured. It's, it's very much a public-private partnership where the government brings credits, but on the flip side, the project is still subject to all the usual market forces, where if, if they're not keeping the property up and, and they're not competitive in the marketplace, well, they're going to suffer as a result. And I think that's part of the beauty of the program that's made it such a wonderful production program, not only production in terms of making units out and getting them out there in the marketplace, but also keeping them up and making them very attractive places for people to live. And, and right. I'll also add, Nicole, that a lot of times developers ask me, like, well, what if Congress decides to do away with the loan housing tax credit program? And there's wide support for the local housing tax credit program within both sides of our uh, political parties. And um, so I look at it and say, well, if they don't do the local housing tax credit program, they're going to do something else. But most likely, you know, what, what, under the current law, what we have, the local housing tax credit program will continue to be supported by um, both uh, political parties and also, most, uh, also the, the president. And so... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a permanent program that's here to stay um, until, you know, someone comes up with a better idea, but it really does work very, very well. And a lot of programs that the government decides to do, they look and mirror them after the LIHTC program because of its success. Because it's been a permanent program since 1990, Nicole, I could be wrong on the date. Um, I think I want to say 93. Yeah, it's been a permanent, a permanent program. I mean, I mean, by permanent, I mean that it's in the Internal Revenue Code, and to get it removed, it takes the act of Congress to remove it. Some, some tax credit set of programs are temporarily 
And so they only last for four or five years. So after a four or five year program, they go away. But this one is, is permanent. It's written in stone until you know, Congress decides to, to remove it, if they did. But that's not in any, in any forecast or any uh, budget you see by the federal government. The Long housing tax credit program is always in, in um, the budget. Oh, that's, that's good to know as well. Um, I think what I'd like to do is just ask uh, a couple things here. Um, one, I want to say thank you for, for joining us today to uh, dive into this and ask that if, uh, if, if you guys would be agreeable to uh, possibly extend this conversation if we uh, uh, had an opportunity here in, in uh, the future. Uh, I find it fascinating, and it just the there is uh, sounds like there's multiple uh, avenues to travel if if uh, one was interested in doing so. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No problem. And also, our firm website. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get your contact com. information for both of you guys. So so go ahead and and uh, and give me your your contact information for both your your website and then you guys individually. Sure, um, uh, novaco.com. N o v o c o Dot com is a website it has a lot of information there for people to go to, and also we do hold annual low-income housing tax credit conferences four times a year. So on our website, if people want to go to a conference, they can go there, and there's podcasts that people can download there as well. Not to compete with this podcast, <laughs> no, no, sorry, it's not podcast webinars. Uh, right. like webinars people can uh, can uh, view and sign up for there. Um, but my personal contact. Information is uh, my phone number is 503-821-2710, and my email address is Warren W A R R E N Sebra S E B R A at Novaco dot com. Don't forget, there's a dot in there in between your first and last name. Oh right, Warren dot Sebra. Yes. All right, and uh, for you, Nicola. Um, you know, you're lucky because uh, due to a conspiracy between my parents and Mike Novogratik's parents, I've got a lot of vowels in my email address. <laughs> so it's going to be N-I-C-O-L-O dot P-I-N-O-L-I at N-O-V-O-C-O dot com. Uh, and I wanted our, to add that... Oh, I'd uh, also say our email addresses are also on our website if, if you yes. go to our website. I wanted right. to add that we've got a YouTube channel as well. For a, a lot of readers and listeners, they might find that being able to see things actually diagrammed out on paper is helpful. And if you go to our YouTube channel, a lot of the details we've mentioned here today are also discussed on our YouTube channel uh, by myself or by some of our colleagues uh, in greater detail that I think might be helpful to some of your listeners. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, again, uh, to both of you, I, I appreciate you taking the time, and it's been a, a, a very informative uh, hour or so we've spent here, and I can't say thank you enough, and, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to doing it again soon. You bet. Excellent. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Nicolo Pinoli and Warren Sebra of Novo Gratic and Company, and possibly you learned more about affordable housing and how low-income housing tax credits work. I know I did. For more information about how low-income housing tax credits work, I encourage you to check out novoco.com, that's N-O-V-O-C-O.com, or contact Warren or Nicolo. Their uh, contact information is on the uh, novoco.com website. And uh, if you own, invest in, or manage any low-income housing tax credit property. I encourage you also to reach out to me to learn more about how we can protect those credits from loss. All right, that about does it for today's program. Uh, but before we go, I just want to remind you, if you like today's program, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can like, you can follow, you can share or comment. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio. You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.